Good afternoon. This is Pamela, and you are listening to Watchmen on the Pod. We are going to continue with our book reading. Um, Let Me Be a Woman by Elizabeth Elliot. We're starting in Chapter 6. Jellyfish and Pride. When you were very small, you used, you used to at times say, some people, when you were really referring to yourself. One night, when we were on board a ship, you were tucked into the upper berth and had just finished your evening prayers. God made everything in the world, you then said to me, but some people don't know why he made jellyfish and tigers. You had been stung once by a jellyfish, and tigers were what you called the ocelots and jaguars that lived in the jungle where we were living. Indians were afraid of them, and so, of course, were you. But you were not asking specifically why God made them. You did not understand it, but you were not admitting that you did not understand it. You were only observing philosophically that there were those who did not. And tactfully, you were not suggesting that your mother might be among them. Your three-year-old mind could hardly have grasped the implications of the mystery you had touched on. For the answer would have to include, from a human standpoint, an explanation of human suffering. Yet the jellyfish and the tiger know what they were made for. They, with all sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, mountains and hills, beasts and all cattle, praise the Lord. Being a jellyfish, the jellyfish glorifies its creator. For being a jellyfish, it fulfills its creator's command. All creatures, with two exceptions that we know of, have willingly taken the places appointed to them. The Bible speaks of angels who rebelled, and therefore were cast down out of heaven, and of the fall of man. Adam and Eve were not satisfied with the place assigned. They refused the single limitation set them in the Garden of Eden and thus brought sin and death to the whole world. It was, in fact, the woman Eve who saw the opportunity to be something other than she was meant to be. The serpent convinced her that she could easily be like God. And she took the initiative. We have no way of knowing whether a consolation with her husband first might have led to an entirely different conclusion. Perhaps it might. Perhaps, if she had put the question to him, and he had to ponder the fact, the matter, he would have seen the deadly implications and have refused the fruit. But Eve had already tried it. She had not been struck dead. She offered it to her husband. How could he refuse? Eve was undoubtedly a beautiful woman. She was the woman God had given him. She was only testing out what seemed an unnecessary and trivial restriction, and her boldness had been rewarded. She had gotten away with it, and now why shouldn't Adam do the same? What sort of world might it have been if Eve had re- refused the serpent's offer and had said to him instead, Let me not be like God. Let me be what I was made to be. Let me be a woman. But the sin was fatal beyond their worst imaginations. It was hubris, a lifting up of the soul in defiance of God, the pride that usurps another place. It is a damnable kind of pride. Chapter 7. The Right Kind of Pride But there is another pride one which every man and woman under God ought to cultivate. Isaac Denson defines it in her beautiful book, Out of Africa. Quote, Pride is faith in the idea that God had when he made us. A proud man is conscious of the idea and aspires to realize it. He does not strive towards a happiness or comfort which may be irrelevant to God's idea of him. His success is the idea of God, successfully carrying through, and he is in love with his destiny. I have learned, but slowly I'm afraid, what it is to be in love with my destiny. Your father learned it much earlier. Whenever you are, he wrote, wherever you are, he wrote, be all there. 
lid to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. In my judgment, I wish I trust is not wholly impaired by my being your mother. You have always known this. You have been almost from birth, not only accepting, but exuberant in your acceptance. People who have no pride, Denson goes on, are not aware of any idea of God in the making of them, and sometimes they make you doubt that there has ever been much of an idea or else it has been lost, and who will find it again? They have got to accept as success what others warrant to be so, and to take their happiness, even their own selves, at the quotation of the day. A few women, whose vision is grotesquely distorted, are trying to redefine us as woman's success and tell us that our happiness lies not in the idea of God in the making of us, but in obliterating that idea altogether. The creation of male and female as com complementary opposites has no place in their thinking, and any definition of masculinity and femininity is totally meaningless except with reference to culture and social expectation. We may alter masculinity and femininity simply by altering the conditioning process. You would understand better than some how greatly cultures and societies differ in their expectations of male and female behavior. For the first eight years of your life, you lived with South American Indians who drew sharp distinctions between the sexes. They were not always the distinctions we North Americans would draw, but distinctions nonetheless. Women wore long hair, men wore short. Men ate first, women waited to eat whatever might be left over when the man had finished. Women were the bearers of heavy burdens. Men were not considered physically capable of this work. Both men and women were willing to work for white people, swinging machetes to clear grass and underbrush, and while the women were usually more efficient at this, their wages were lower than the men's even, though the hours were the same. <clears throat> Men hunted, women planted. Men used guns, blow guns or shotguns, depending on how civilized they were. Women made fishnets, pots, hammocks, sieves. Men wove baskets. You, as a little foreigner girl, took your own place among them, learning to catch fish with your hands as the women did, cooking, mashing, chewing, and spitting your mononic in order to make chicka, and then, before you drank yours, serving the little boys who were your friends. You learned to swing a machete and to build fires and to walk the trails with one foot in front of the other. And you also knew that, like the Indian children, you were not expected to complain. I can't remember when we first spoke of sex. You grew up before knowing about it. When you were, you grew up knowing about it. When you were hardly out of diapers, you helped me to save the life of a baby who was having a hard time being born. It was a breach presentation, and the women had already begun the death wail for both mother and child and refused to help me. I needed a warm cloth to wrap around the baby's body to help keep it from trying to breathe too soon, but no one wanted to soil the clothes they had. You had and ran. You ran and brought me one of your own diapers and then watched in amazement with the others as the baby was born at last alive and yelling you were only three when we went to live with the acas who were naked people and whose conversations was almost exclusively of hunting spearing and sex there was no choice of vocabulary the Agu language did not distinguish between a clinical a nursery and gutter vocabulary there were perfectly straightforward words for organs functions and activities and any everyday conversation might include them so you learned from them of course and now you have forgotten all that along with all the rest of the language you knew but you remember the people and the life you lived with them there and for that i am glad you always carried your dolls in a carrying cloth as indian mothers did and as you yourself had been carried 
You played house with the Indian children, something they had never thought of doing, but you showed them how to fix a little place in the hollow of a tree root and build a tiny fire in the middle of it. For, after all, the only really essential item in a house in the jungle was a fire. Were you conforming to social pressure and playing such girl games? Surely not. Surely it was because you were born a woman. There was in you a knowledge divinely given on what your imagination, more active than the Indians, went to work. As you grew older and we came to the States to live, I remember how eagerly you went to school for the first time. You started the fourth grade and in a few days you had caught the rhyme of this new life, the rhythm of this new life. So different from the old one, and in what seemed to me a matter of weeks, you had grown up. We had talked when you were about, when you were small, about the wonders of being a woman. Once, when you were about four, you were interviewed on a children's talk show on the radio. What are you going to be when you grow up, Valerie? You were asked, of course. Just want to be a mommy, was your unhesitating reply. Growing up was very exciting. You could hardly wait. And when the day came, at last, when you knew you were a woman indeed, you came to tell me about it, and your eyes shone. Chapter 8 The Weight of Wings Perspective makes all the difference in the world. If you catch even a glimpse of the divine design, and who can see more than a glimpse of it anyway, you will be humbled and awed at least. I believe a true understanding of... It will also make you grateful, but there are those to whom being a woman is nothing more than an inconvenience to be suffered because it is unavoidable and to be ignored if at all possible. Their lives are spent pining to be something else. Every creature of God is given something that could be called an inconvenience, I suppose, depending on one's perspective. The elephant and the mouse might each complain about his size, the turtle about his shell, the bird about the weight of his wings. But elephants are not called upon to run behind wine-scots. Mice will not be found pacing along as though they have an appointment at the end of the world. Turtles have no need to fly, nor birds to creep. The special gift and ability of each creature defines its special limitations. And as the bird easily comes to terms with the necessity of bearing wings when it finds that it is, in fact, the wings that bear the bird up away from the world into the sky into freedom, so the woman who accepts the limitations of womanhood finds, it, though, finds in those very limitations her gifts, her special calling, wings, in fact, which bear her up unto perfect freedom into the will of God. You have heard me tell of Gladys Allward, the small woman of China, whom I heard speak many years ago at Prairie Bible Institute in Alberta. She told how when she was a child she had two great sorrows, one that while all her friends had beautiful golden hair, hers was black, the other that while her friends were still growing, she stopped. She was about four feet ten inches tall, and when at last she reached the country to which God had called her to be a missionary, she stood on the wharf in Shanghai and looked around at the people to whom he had called her. Every single one of them, she said, had black hair, and every single one of them had stopped growing when I did. And I said, Lord God, you know what you are doing. Chapter 9, Single Life, A Gift what we are is a gift, and like other gifts, chosen by the giver alone. We are not presented with an array of options. What would you like to be? How tall? What color? What temperament would you prefer? Which parents would you choose as forebears? So, you are a woman, chosen from the foundation of the world, given to parents who would ask for a son, and only God knows how often and how profoundly I have thanked him that that ignorant prayer was denied. And before you were twenty, you had given your heart to the man who was to be your husband. So you have not really known what it is to be a single woman. You have not been asked to struggle with that question. 
Relatively, few women have to, for most women marry, and of those who marry, 90% do so before the age of 21, which means that they have not known what it is to be a single woman in the world. They have probably lived with and been provided for by their parents most of their lives. Many have been in college until the time of their marriage, as you will have been, and hence have had their time mapped out for them. No major decisions will ever have been entirely up to them. I have told you a little of my own perplexity about this issue when I was a college student, for I believe God was calling me to a missionary and quite possibly a single one. I wanted to be a missionary, but I did not want to be a single one. It seemed that I was to go to Africa, and the only man I had interest in was on his way to South America, the one place I had been quite certain I would never go. There came a day, only a week before I graduated, when that man I had talked about marriage, when that man and I had talked about marriage and the direction in which God seemed to be leading us, and I remember him telling me then that St. Paul regarded single life as a gift. Well, I thought wearily, St. Paul did have some bizarre ideas and was certainly not to be taken too seriously in his views on marriage. What did he know about marriage? He was single because he liked being single, and I was suspicious of a man like that. It has since occurred to me that we have no evidence that Paul had never been married. But having now spent more than 41 years single, I have learned that it is indeed a gift. Not one I would choose. Not one many women would choose. But we do not choose gifts, remember? We are given them by a divine giver who knows the end from the beginning and wants above all else to give us the gift of himself. It is within the sphere of the circumstances he chooses for us, single, married, widowed, that we receive him. It is there and nowhere else that he makes himself known to us. It is there we are allowed to serve him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says it is best for each man to have his own wife and for each woman to have her own husband because of the temptation to immorality. Then he says almost immediately, I wish that all were as I, I myself am, but each has his own special gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is well for them to remain single as I do, but if they cannot control, they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion." For the next five years after my graduation, until I married him, that young man and I waited on God, prayed, searched the scriptures, corresponded, and on very wildly spaced occasions were able to talk about these matters. Was Paul setting the single life above marriage? It had certainly seemed so. He spoke of the weaknesses which could not could resist temptation and of the hindrances to serve for God which marriage would inevitably bring. He reminded the Corinthians of the impending distress which would make it unwise for a person to seek to change his marital status in any way. He said that the man who marries his betrothed does well, but the man who refrains from marriage does better. A widow, in Paul's judgment, is happier if she does not remarry, and he thought that he had the Spirit of God in this. No wonder we were confused, and no wonder that a man of your family's father's determination should ponder long and earnestly the apparent contradictions in this hard chapter. He longed for the better and happier way. He was determined to prove God's strength and grace is sufficient to overcome the ordinary weaknesses of a man's flesh. He knew his own great attraction for women. He was determined also to serve the Lord without entanglements. But the time came when marriage was for him a clear command, and he knew then that it was a gift given by the same giver who gives to some the special gift of being single. Let every one lead the life which the Lord has assigned to him. To a young man who was facilitating on the question of marriage, Martin Luther wrote, 
Chastity is not in our power, as little as our God's other wonders and graces, but we are all made for marriage as our bodies show, and as the scripture states in Genesis 1, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. I fancy that human fear and timidity stand in your way. It is, said, it is said that it takes a bold man to venture to take a wife. What you need above all else, then, is to be encouraged, admonished, urged, incited, and made bold. Why should you delay, my dear and reverend friend, sir, and continue to weigh the matter in your mind? It must, it should, and will happen in any case. Stop thinking about it and go to it right meridly. Your body demands it, God wills it, and drives you to it. There is nothing that you can do about it. It is best to comply with all our senses as soon as possible and give ourselves to God's word and work in whatever he wishes us to do. Let us not try to fly higher and better than Abraham, David, Isaiah, Peter, Paul, and all the patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, as well as many holy martyrs and bishops all of whom knew that they were created by God as men, were not ashamed to be and be thought men, conducted themselves accordingly, and did not remain alone. Whoever is ashamed of marriage is also ashamed of being a man or being thought a man, or else he thinks that he can make himself better, that God made him. And that I'm going to end there for now. Oh, my goodness. Great insights. Very, very good insights. I'm very pleased with this book, actually. It speaks to me personally. I'm, I'm praying and hoping that the women that listen to this reading, it will speak to you as well. It's beautiful. I am very thankful that God created me to be a woman and that he put me in the family that he did. Though it seemed like at times we were very dysfunctional and still am, I am thankful that he placed me in the family that he did and that I was born a woman. I thank you all for listening. Until next time, keep your eyes on Jesus, your nose in the book, and embed the word of God upon the tablets of your hearts so you will not sin against God. I love you all. Have a